what makes you angry? That's not an arbitrary question. Think about it. What just gets you like fired up, man? You're just mad. Like you, ugh. Now, I'm going to be honest. I, if you know me very well, I hope you think this about me. I don't get riled up about much. I personally don't get super angry about stuff, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, before I got real serious about my, my faith, uh, anger was one of my biggest things I struggled with. I would just lash out, ask my wife when we were dating, and ask my parents who were like, I think we're going to have to commit him to some sort of institution. Like, it was, it was rough for a season. So that's something that for a long time in my life, I really, really worked on my own anger and rage and things like that. And so I have a life motto. I haven't said it in a while to a group of people, but I want to show you my life motto. You know what it is? My life motto, and you can adapt this, and it will change everything for you. This is the life motto. Ready? <sighs> chill out. That's it. That's it. Just imagine how much different life would be if everybody would just chill so much. Imagine how much politics would be different if everybody would just chill out a little bit. Imagine like an altercation on a sidewalk outside where people are getting about to fight. If everybody would just chill out, take a step back, take a deep breath, and recognize like, what's at stake here? Is this really that important? So that's really, that's something God's been working on in me for a long time. But there are some things that make people angry. Some of you guys get mad about stuff. I went online. I want to have some fun with this because it's kind of a serious topic, but I want to have some fun with this. And I found a list of uh, things that people got angry about on the internet. If you want something ridiculous, look at the internet. It's on there. Uh, here, here are a couple. See if you relate to any of these. Okay, so there was this guy who said his girlfriend broke up with him, broke up with him. She was really, really angry because he failed to put a smiley face emoji at the end of their good night text one night. Yeah, it's over. It's I'm going to go on a limb here and say that, that that relationship was toast before that text. Um, but she got angry, broke up with Okay, here's one. A total stranger says he was at a bus stop, and a guy sneezed. And he was like, bless you. And the guy was like, it wasn't a sneeze, it was a cough. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I thought it was a sneeze. And he said, well, it wasn't. And then he just stormed off and didn't even get on the bus. <laughs> Dude's got issues, man. It's like, that's the angry that we live with. Here's one. A grandparent said this. Okay, so parents... Kids are crazy, man. This is a grandparent. She said, my grandson got mad at me for putting apples in his oatmeal after he had asked me to put apples in his oatmeal. <laughs> Grandma, throwing spoons and stuff. Uh, one guy said, my, I got a good friend who this happens to him all the time. He said, my wife constantly wakes me up in the middle of the night angry at me for something I did in her dream. <laughs> Chill out. I think that's happened to us one time in our 20 years of marriage, so we're doing all right. But, so we get angry about a lot of things, and, uh, you know, there's some legitimate things we get angry about, too. It really frustrates me when people don't keep commitments. That's something, like, if someone says, I'll be there, and then they just, last minute, like, I can't make it. That's just our culture. We just cancel all the time. Can't do it. Can't, and it, it really rubs me and a lot of people the wrong way. Like, you say you'll be there because it makes you look good in the moment, but actually, I don't think you recognize how bad it makes you look over the long haul when you constantly back out of stuff. And so that's maybe a legitimate thing. One thing that really fires me up, this like really gets me angry, and there is a time to be angry. We see J Jesus angry in the Bible. We see God angry about a few things, injustice and unrighteousness and stuff like that. One thing that really fires me up is when, uh, talking to Kim just this, this morning, when people uh, just ruin the innocence of children. On any level, you know, and she, she, she indicated some really bad areas. But even, I was at a New Hanover uh, High School football game Friday night, and we were in the concession stand, and I saw this mom just angry at her daughter, and she grabbed her by the shoulders, and she just began to cuss her out right in her face. And you see this girl's face just drooping, and I'm just like, these are things like, if you're in a fight in a penitentiary, you shouldn't say these things. And she's screaming them in her daughter's impressionable, innocent face. And talk about brokenness piling on top of brokenness, piling on top of brokenness that makes you get crushed. That just fires me up. So there's some legitimate things to get angry about. What makes you angry? What gets you fired up, hot under the collar, mad, to a point where you're just willing to, to fight somebody? What gets you angry? Some people go hardcore over politics. Um, phew, chill out. What if it's road rage? I've been in a car with some of you guys. I'm like, hey, we good? All right, everything okay? <laughs> I mean, road rage, you're like, you're just, someone didn't use their turn signal, and so you're freaking out, yelling them through the windshield. They have no clue that, that you're mad. They don't care. You know? Have you ever accidentally cut somebody off? Oh, yes, you have. You don't know about it, because it was an accident. Um, and maybe it's just pet peeves, little things. It's, yeah. Some people get set off by the smallest thing. You didn't put the toothpaste back on the lid, back on the toothpaste, and didn't put the seat back. The, the to Who gets really hot about the toilet paper being the wrong way? Like, I get it. It's a big deal, okay? But we could probably let it go. And so, but there's some things that just get us riled up. So today we're continuing our series we're just calling Unmasking, 
are monsters. And the whole big idea, you know, cat out of the bag, is that there, there's these like vices, there's these emotions, there's these feelings that we tend to have that are desperately bad for us. It will hurt us. And that at each one, there is a God-given truth that will set us free from that, unmask us from that monster. Uh, openly, I'm saying, look, we're doing this kind of like as a Halloween theme. It's, it's October. I've never done a Halloween theme sermon series. I thought it'd be fun. I'm talking about monsters. But man, you could talk about this any time of the year. Last week, we talked about guilt. And so what we said was that guilt has a, a solution. Anybody remember what the solution to guilt is? Confession. Confession. So to take the things that you feel bad about and then getting it out in the open really helps us deal with the monster of guilt. We're going to talk uh, next week. I'm pumped. Uh, Perry's going to be speaking in here, and it's be his first chance to share in this new building. He's going to be talking about greed. Greed is a thing that just gets, gets in us, and it controls us, and it changes who we are, and he'll give a solution for that from God's word. The final week, we're talking about jealousy, that old green-eyed monster, envy. And I mean, how many times has being jealous or overcome by wanting to be somebody else or something else changed you? And there's an answer for that. This week, the monster's anger. Anger is like one of the most primordial emotions. It's like one of the most base emotions. If you've ever seen a child who doesn't get what they want and is also not receiving adequate discipline, they will lose it with anger. And they will run their family with their anger. Anger creates something in us. Um, there's, there's an author named Andy Stanley. Uh, you might have heard of him. He's a preacher in uh, near Atlanta, Georgia. And he talks about these ideas, and he says that these, there's these emotions and these things in our life that, that create in us a debt-to-debtor relationship. So follow that, debt-to-debtor. Like you owe someone money, that's debt, and then the, the debtor, there's the person that is in debt, and there's someone that they owe something to. And so that these debt-to-debtor relationships work in some of these emotions we deal with. For example, guilt has a debt-to-debtor relationship. When I feel guilt, what I feel, the debt that I feel is that I owe you. I did something wrong to you, so I owe you, or I owe God, or I owe society. It's an I owe you type debt-to-debtor relationship. And anger has the same type of scenario. Uh, debt, debt, um, the debt-to-debtor relationship in anger says that you owe me. Life isn't the way that I wish it was. Things aren't going the way that I want them to go. You owe me. The world owes me. People owe me. The government owes me. My neighbors owe me. The neighbor's dog owes me. Everybody owes me. Now, now that's just giving us some like, context to understand what's going on in your heart. But what it also shows is this. An angry person is a hurt person. Someone who is dealing in anger is dealing in pain. An angry person at their core is a hurt person. It also kind of puts some skin on the idea of how we deal with people who are angry. You ever have someone you work with that's like, man, you're just grumpy all the time. Yes, they need a Snickers. Yes, they need an attitude check. But it's probably coming from a place that they're hurt. Life hasn't gone their way at some point. And that pain is coming out of them in the way that they treat other people. And so someone cuts you off in traffic. Your debt to data relationship is, you owe me. You cut me off in traffic. You ruin my day until you call them names and you yell at them out the window. And because you're trying to receive payment back for the debt that they owe you. Uh, someone abused you in a major way. That you ruined my life, you took something from me. It's a debt to debt relationship. And the problem with this is our anger doesn't actually solve the debt. It, it can't pay the price because there's no such thing as like an undo button in life. There can be some sort of like retribution paid, some sort of like, okay, I, I can do this instead. But you can't actually undo the thing that was done, can you? No time machine involved. And so this brokenness like presides over us and it's kind of ironic because we lash out because innately we want it to be dealt with it's ironic because it will never fix it our anger will never fix the brokenness because at the core something else has to happen so what's the remedy for anger Uh, every one of these things is just going to have like a a one word remedy the remedy for anger is is pretty simple and you're not going to like it it's forgiveness you know, forgiveness is a financial word. It is. Like when we talk about Jesus forgives us of our sins or there's forgiveness, I forgive you. It actually comes from like accounting because forgiveness is, is, the, is the process of letting go of a debt. Your debt has been forgiven. When you pay off a loan, when you pay off your mortgage, when you pay off your car, the bank isn't going to call you anymore looking for that payment anymore. You're not going to get the letters anymore. They might call you about your extended warranty and that's not them. Don't answer. It's not for you. But the only solution for this debt that we feel owed because, and it leads to anger is forgiveness. 
being able to, to rise above it to a space where I can say, I can let this go. I can t- take a deep breath, and I can exhale forgiveness, and it's not easy. And so what I want to do is just take a look at what the Bible says about forgiveness in terms of how we react to the world around us and in terms of how God reacts to us. And then just see, as a group today, can we leave here a little bit different than we were when we came? And so if you've got a Bible today, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. So grab your Bibles. Uh, it's going to be on the screen here beside me, but also look it up on your phone. There's going to be some stuff you're going to want to highlight or underline. Look it up uh, in your paper Bibles. I want to remind you, we do have paper Bibles in the lobby for anybody who needs one. I've been saying for a long time, let's be a church that brings our Bibles to church. Let's be a church that studies scripture together. And so uh, this would be a good reminder of that. But we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4. That's in the New Testament of the Bible, uh, like the last third of your New Testament of, of your Bible. And Ephesians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of people in a city called Ephesus. And so as he's talking to the Ephesians, the people in Ephesus, one thing that he's talking about is how that we might be able to kind of cleanse our mind and our soul and our conscience of some of these things that are going on within us. So Ephesians 4, starting at verse 31. It's pretty straightforward. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. And so this phrase, get rid of. Y'all, y'all need help back there? I see it's struggling. Just click on a, on a background that's got a, the right background, and then go to the right slide. So let's take a look at what Paul says about this, ranger, this anger and this bitterness and rage. He says, get rid of. So what does it mean to get rid of something? So I've had this like ongoing battle in my, at my house. And, and look, I'm not ashamed to say it because I know we all live in the South. And, and even though Wilmington's got a lot of like uh, buildings and stuff, we're, the, the critters still live here, okay? They're still up in your house, okay? And so I got this shed outside that I think that the rodents really want to live in. So we've got these mice and these rats and stuff who just keep on trying to take up residence in my, in my shed. And it's driving me crazy. So we've been there for like, what, seven, eight years now? And like every time I feel like I got rid of the mice, they somehow get back into my shed. I'm like, what are you doing? Why is this happening? And so like, what does it mean to get rid of them? Man, I have gone full on Rambo on these things. Like you go to Lowe's. If you ever been to Lowe's, it's the section like kill all the creatures section. You know that section? I bought everything they got, okay? And like I'm, I've shot BB guns at them. That's the real story. I've like tried everything I can, chase them down with baseball bats, whatever I can do. Because these things get in your stuff and they pee on it and they chew up your stuff. The other day I found one had built a nest in my golf bag. Like, in my whole golf bag, I took the whole thing to the landfill. I was like, I don't need golf that much in my life. I can't stand it. But the thing is, I want to get rid of these things. So what do I do? Everything possible. Everything possible. So I've gone on with the sticky traps. Are they inhumane? Yes, but they deserve it, right? I got the spring traps. I got the poison. I found that the poison works the best because it must taste good. And just when I think I got rid of them, it was like three weeks ago. I mean, I go through, I got this like expandable foam spray stuff. You've seen this stuff? You can spray it in all the little cracks and it fills all the cracks. I'm like, how are you getting in here? What's, how are you doing? You must have a key to the door. Like, how are you getting into this thing? I filled all the cracks. And then, but I always know when I got one because you walk in, you're like, ugh. And then I'm like, <laughs> got, but it got me back. It got me back because then I got to deal with him. Like, he's in the dead in this floor. I want to get rid of the rats in my shed. And I'm going to do everything I can because our Christmas decorations are in there. And my kids' teddy bears from when they were small are in boxes in there, right? What does it mean for us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with any form of malice? There's a key word in this passage. It's the word all. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, rage, and all these things. All, A-A-L, a very small word, but like if you put it in front of it, all bitterness, all rage, all brawling, all slander. Like having just a little piece of it is like a little bitty mouse. He's not hurting anything until he has 500 babies. And that's what happens in our life. When we have these little bitty pieces of evil that take up residence alongside our heart, and they grow in us, and they grow in us, and they grow in us. And I think that all of us from time to time have these moments where we're just like, this is taking me over right now. This is consuming me right now. And it's a little piece of something that's going in. When I look at Paul saying this, I think there's this, there's this like um, feeling we get when we read the Bible. We're like, that's just really old. Like they're so out of touch. 
the Apostle Paul lived over 2,000 years ago. It's easy for you to say, get rid of all bitterness and anger and slander and malice and deceit and all these things. It's easy for you to say. You lived in simpler times. I mean, check out some history, man. One of the hardest times to be alive was in the first century. The Roman Empire was huge, and anybody who wasn't on board with their game plan was really fighting against the current. Religious persecution was legal, in fact, enforced by the government. Not to mention that these were harder times to live in in general. Paul was in a position where by the time he wrote this, we believe that he's already been uh, you know, run out of multiple towns. One town stoned him and left him for dead outside. Depending on how you read the scripture, it looks like he died, and maybe the Holy Spirit raised him back to life. Like That's how beat up he got. He had visions of people tying him up and throwing him in prison. He was actually in prison for a long period of his life, the last portion of his life, for something he was actually unjustly charged for. Now, he stayed in prison on purpose because he wanted to appeal his case higher and higher so he could eventually maybe see Caesar. So it was like a strategy he had to get into Rome. But if anybody understood being frustrated, being angry, and then can I remind you what Paul's job was before he became a Christian? If you don't know, he went by the name Saul. That was his Hebrew name. And as Saul, he worked for the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish council. And what he did was he would go out and he would find Christians because they believed Christianity was a, uh, a perversion of their faith and that it had to be stomped out. And he had letters from the government that gave him permission to persecute those Christians to the point of arranging their executions. We don't know specifically if he personally took uh, part in the executions, but we do know that he stood by and watched. And you can't live that kind of life. And that's your job without having a little bit of hate in your heart for somebody. It gets in you. It hurts. And so for Paul to write this, I feel like he's coming from a place of really understanding what it means to be an angry person. And saying, this is why I'm telling you, you got to get rid of all of it. You can't nest just a little bit of it in your heart. Because if you do, it'll come out in big ways. Okay, so what's the alternative? Like, just get rid of it. Just stop it. The old, uh, was it Bob, Bob Newhart thing? Just stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. Like, that feels like the best counseling you could give to anybody about anything. But if you've ever tried to stop something, you realize it's almost impossible because we're psychotic human beings and we get in patterns and we can't stop. Addiction is real and pain is real, right? So you can't just stop it. You've got to be strategic about it. You've got to replace it. Talk to any therapist about working through an addiction in addition to all of the chemical things you've got to work out in your brain. One of the things you've got to do is learn to replace it. You've got to replace the way you think. You've got to replace the way you act. You've got to replace the people that influence you. You've got to replace the self-talk and the words that you put into your head. And you've got to replace the anger with something else. And look what Paul suggests here. We're going to look at it again. Verse 41, it says, get rid of all bitterness. I'm going to add all rage, all anger, all brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Verse 32 says, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Well, Paul's right there. We'll finish the verse in a second. Forgiving each other. Kindness and compassion. So these are character traits we're going to try to do instead. Chill out. And forgive each other. Because an angry person is a hurt person. You owe me. So I've got to get to the heart of what I think you owe me. And I've got to say, I've got to find a way to let that go. But then there's three more words that really make this hit home. Let me read that sentence again. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. In Christ, God forgave you. Maybe you've heard the phrase, forgiven people forgive people. Let me say it again because I don't want you to miss it. Forgiven people forgive people. If you've ever experienced a second chance, if you've ever been given some mercy and some grace, if you've ever been in a lot of trouble and someone said, I'm going to let the consequences go or give you a little bit of a break on the consequences. If you've ever had a cop come to your window and just give you a warning ticket. One, you, you, hopefully you drive a little differently. Two, you start to learn forgiven people, forgive people. And I think one of the biggest things that we fail to miss in accepting Jesus is that, like, we're supposed to, like, reflect his character back into the world. The things that he does for us, we do for others. The things that he says are the things that we say. 
The things that he thinks are the we, things that we think. The book of uh, 1 Corinthians talks about developing the mind of Christ. It's a big, big shift in our mentality. We've talked for several weeks now. We keep talking about transformation, transformation, transformation. I said earlier, I hope that we can come in here and leave differently than we came in. Transformation, transformation, transformation. Because what we have to do is we have to learn that forgiven people forgive people. And we need to learn to forgive just as Christ. God forgave you. In Christ, God forgave you. And it's key to remember that you don't deserve the forgiveness you get from Christ. Let me take a second to step aside here. I never want to miss the opportunity to tell you what Christianity is all about. It's not about us getting a new building. Yay. It's not about us serving, soaring as eagles and the students over there. It's great. Those things are all great. It's not about us having a place where we can get together and sing songs that we like or give opinions about songs that we don't like so we can sing songs that we do like. Is that, and all those things are part of it, right? But we, we are part of the body of Christ because God loved the world so much that he came into this world to reconnect us with the Father, with himself. He took on human flesh. And he said, let me model for you what it looks like to live a way that honors me. Where am I going to start? Forgiveness. You've sinned. You've gone against what God wants you to do. But I'm going to give you a path so that you can be forgiven. And so if you're in the room right now and, and, and you're in a place where you're like, I don't know. Maybe you've done church for a little while. Maybe you grew up in church and you're just back for a little while. Maybe you've been coming here for a little while. But have you ever taken the intentional moment to say, I want to redirect my life towards Jesus. We call it lordship. I'm no longer the Lord of my life. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. It's in, it's in those moments where we make that, that intentional shift of lordship. We saw Lucas get baptized last week over here. And in those moments that we see in Scripture, everyone who accepts Jesus immediately, like as soon as possible, finds himself in some water. It's an act of, of, of death, burial, and resurrection. It's new life. That's what it is. That just as in Christ God forgave you, we might learn to live with love, and compassion, and kindness. I think it's probably where Paul got the incentive to write what he wrote in Romans chapter 8. One of his most famous scriptures that, that we talk about. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God, he demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, while we were broken in it. Well, we were living in it. Christ died for us. And let me read you the rest of this passage. Listen to the context. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him, through Jesus? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? And I love the word that Paul chooses to use here. At least the English translators use the word wrath. Like we've been talking about anger this morning. I want us to understand God has anger. God has wrath. Read some of the prophets in the Old Testament. See what God has to say about people who disobey him and live uh, in injustice to other people and live in unrighteousness to other people. It's called wrath. And like wrath is like a next level of, of anger. Have you seen that movie? Uh, what's the Pixar movie with all the little critters uh, and their emotions? What's that thing called? Inside Out. That's a great. I was going to show a clip from Inside Out, but it was just too long, and I got too entertained by the animation. But there's this little character in there. He's just anger, right? And we all have one in our head. That's the idea of the. the you know, some of y'all seen that. You're like, yeah. Other y'all's like, what are you talking about? We were talking about Paul. Anger. But when 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 anger gets really mad, it's wrath, and wrath must be satisfied. And God had kind of two choices, from what I understand, looking at Scripture. He says, I got wrath against you, mankind. I mean, one time he was so upset about it that he flooded the whole world, killed everybody but one family. This is God who so loved the world. This is God is love from 1 John. How could that God do that? You've you got to understand the, the, the standard to which he places holiness, righteousness. He wants to see his character reflected in his creation. And when we get to a point when we sway so far from that that we're unrecognizable to him, it's like some of you that I know as parents have had to make the tough parenting decision with your adult children. It's like, I cut you off for a little while. That's one side of God's wrath. Judgment. I am talking about eternal separation from God here. I'm talking about what we talk about as hell, right? I don't bang that fire and brimstone pulpit very often, but it's very real. But I believe that God's other side of that coin is the one that Jesus emphasizes. 
His other option is forgiveness, grace, mercy that you can't earn, can't deserve. He says, listen, you can see my wrath if you want to. But to unmask the monster of anger, I could also offer forgiveness. You owe me, but I cancel that debt. You follow? And God said, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a beautiful picture of what it means to forgive. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Anger gets us nowhere. Anger gets us nowhere, but forgiveness puts the ball back in your court. With, with anger, you actually you live in like a victim state. I'm, I'm constantly responding to what's been done to me. As a victim, as a victim, you don't have control. You're just under the shoe of whoever you're being victimized by. And maybe you've been a victim. And I don't say that at all to bring any light, like to make light of it. Serious scenario, and victimization is a real thing. People are often oppressed and pushed down and beat up. But from the position underneath the foot of whatever you're dealing with, you can make a choice to not let them have control of your mind and your heart. And forgiveness puts the ball back in your court. Someone puts apples in your oatmeal. You say, you know what, Grandma? Everybody makes mistakes. Someone cuts you off in traffic. I've probably done this before. I probably should chill out. Someone does you truly wrong, abuses you, takes advantage of you. Look, forgiving them doesn't mean saying that what you did was okay. Forgiving them says, I've got to move on. I can't be stuck in this moment forever. Because as long as I stay stuck here, I'm frozen in the moment where you offended me. That's got to change. Maybe I need to remove myself from the situation. Maybe you need to tell some people in authority. Maybe you need to you know, get some people behind you to take care of whatever thing continues to happen. But you do not have to live in a place of anger. And it's not easy. Especially the, the more they owe you, the harder it is to forgive the debt. But the more freeing it is for your soul. Because you can let it go and you can move on. You can say, you stay back there in that trash. I'm moving on. Guys, we've got to be here for each other. There are people who truly are in broken places. And we can see that, and maybe someone's confided that in you, and that's where we come along one another. We always say, listen, this is a place where no one should venture alone, right? We're in this place together. What are you going through? Do you need help talking through this? Do you need help getting out of a dangerous situation? Yes. But how can we learn to cope emotionally also with what's going on? So what do we do? In the time that we got left, what I want to do is just talk about like, some practical steps for forgiveness, because this is hard. This is hard. Some, some, some in the room right now will be like, I don't really feel angry about anything. That's fantastic. But I know there's some people in the room right now who are like, I wake up every day angry about something. Something, maybe it's a different thing every day. It's just become like a, a character trait of you. Like you can just jump on anger for anything because it becomes really easy. It's the, it's the language that you speak. Or maybe it's a very specific thing that you can't let go. I've got, I've got what I think are four pretty practical steps. And if you're a note taker, this would be a good thing to, to kind of work through as a discipline this week. Write them down. See if you can actually do them. If you're in a small group or one of the discipleship groups or anything that are going on, maybe this is a conversation you could have with them. But check out. These four things. The first one is this. If we're going to forgive, we have to first identify who you're angry with or what you're angry about. Who you're angry with and what you're angry about. Like, so, why do I feel this way? You could pay a lot of money to go to a counselor, and they could probably spend six months finally helping you get to the bottom of that. And maybe you need to do that, because sometimes it's so locked up inside of you. Why do I feel this way? Who are you angry at? And what are you angry about? Because until you name it, you can't forgive it. You can't move on past it. It's just this arbitrary thing. What is it? I don't know. I'm just mad. All the time, I'm just mad. So maybe workshop that with somebody. Maybe go with somebody and say, look, can we, can we talk about this together? Identify who you're angry with and what you're angry about. But this is the next step that's huge. You have to determine what they owe you. Determine what they owe you. I'm angry about this. Why? I mean, because if it's like you're angry because someone cuts you off in traffic, but what they do come back is later and say, listen, I'm sorry I stole your cheeseburger. You're like, you stole my cheeseburger? I'm angry about that. Look, we have to like nail down, like, what is it that's really getting under my skin here? And this is what I find to be true when I talk to people. You can't, like, sometimes you're like, I don't even know what I'm mad about anymore. I don't even know what they owe me. This happens with spouses a lot. 
I'm just mad because you just got on my nerves. <laughs> you looked at me wrong. And like when that's the case, it's actually probably something even deeper. Like if you're just angry for no reason at all, dig deeper. What is it? Maybe growing up you didn't get the support that you felt like you needed and it comes up in your mind. Or maybe someone just really did you wrong. Determine what they owe you. And this is the hardest part. Number three. Cancel the debt. Someone cuts you off in traffic, that's pretty easy. Well, some of you need to know. I need to tell you. I, I've been on the other side. It's pretty easy. <laughs> it's actually easy when someone actually hasn't physically hurt you or harmed you. It's just, just, I mean, sometimes you just get angry because someone's wearing a certain T-shirt or because you know they, they're on a certain side of some issue. You're just angry just in general. I just, but when it's harder to cancel the debt, that's when you need more help. That's when I recommend you get with some friends. You maybe seek some professional therapy. Pray about it. We are a praying church. We need to continue that. And so if you're coming in, I have dealt with this particularly in my life. A quick story. I had an individual who really hurt me bad. Um, Early in in ministry, I was was working at a church, and this person really hurt me bad. Uh, And then what, what they put me through was not cool. I didn't like it. And I didn't really have a, the voice to say what I felt like I should have said. I didn't know what I should have said. I was just angry. And what's funny is I moved away. I was living in another state, another city. But every now and then, I would just get just ticked at that person. I would just be like, Rah. and I'd just think about them. And I would wish that they, something bad would happen to them. They would, you know, like maybe they're just having a bad day. That would make me feel better. I don't know. Just bitter. And I worked through that, and I was talking to some people about it. It's funny. It was like, this is stupid, okay? This is how dumb we get. It was probably 12 or 15 years later, okay? (laughs) And I saw this person posting some stuff on Facebook. I'm like, how dare you post that? Hypocrite, jerk. (laughs) Sideline, I'm also constantly trying to check myself on this. Like, why are you even angry about this? Like, you need to let it go, man. Let it go. I talked to people about it. But finally, I just said, I I need to cancel the debt. So I sat down, and I wrote a letter. It was a pretty long letter, and it went right back. You might remember in, like, 2004, um, (laughs) And uh, I wrote this letter, and I wrote down some things. I said, "Listen, I, I need to tell you, this is more about me than it is about you. I'm sure that, I'm sure that you've moved on, <laughs> but I want to tell you that, like, I, I need to forgive you, and I forgive you." And I honestly was like, "Do I send this? This seems ridiculous. Like this, as you write it out, you're like, is it really?" But I sent it. I, I, I prayed about it. I talked to some friends. I'm like, just send it. And what you? Like, they read the letter. Like, this is, it's not offensive. It's not mean. Just send it. So I sent it. What's wild is this person immediately messaged me back, and I eventually got on the phone with them. They were like, I am so sorry. And then they began to share with me what God had been doing in their heart in the last 15 years. In that season, I was going through this and this and this. And I thought I was the perfect Christian. And I thought I had everything figured out. And I, I, she said, I'm going to be honest with you. And I hope this doesn't make you mad. But I don't even remember that thing I said to you. I was like, well, great. I do. I remember it very well. But then they began to tell me what God had done in their life. And how they'd changed. And I realized that I was the jerk. <laughs> that isn't going to be all of our stories. But we reconciled and we were able to talk. And we were able to catch up. And I was able to celebrate what God was doing in their life. And I can tell you, man, it is so freeing. But canceling that debt, that's a hard thing to do. I don't recommend that you all write letters to everybody. <laughs> uh, that's something that should be done very carefully and in certain situations. But at least to the fourth thing. Dismiss the case. Uh, it's been a while, but there was a season in my life where I just couldn't drive the speed limit. Um, I tried. It was a struggle, personal struggle. Couldn't drive the speed limit. Got a lot of tickets. And there were occasions where I went in, and uh, because of, you know, whatever circumstances, the judge was like, I just dismissed this. Man, that feels so good to my insurance agent. Um, like, when you no longer have that on your record, but I, I know people who they have charges on their, their, their file, that keeps them from getting jobs, you know? There are cases against them that they've been free from whatever thing they did for 25 years, but it just still follows them because it's a label. And I've been guilty of that. And I've been in conversations where people have been guilty of that, where if you bring up, you know, Bob, and people are like, you know, Bob. Bob does this and this. I'm like, he was in high school when he did that. Like, I'm sure he's changed a little. If we don't learn to dismiss the case and move forward, we, we, we are guilty of sticking them in that same space forever just as much as, as we are keeping ourselves in that space forever. So we've got to dismiss the case. We've got we to identify 
what we're angry with, determine what the person owes you. That's the, the homework. Then the hard part is cancel the debt, dismiss the case. That's a big, long thing, but I'm telling you, um, it might take you six months of counseling to get to that list, okay? So it saves you some money, too. Work it out with somebody. Anger is a monster that we've got to unmask. And there are times when we, have a, we can have a righteous indignation, a righteous anger, but we can step up and say, I'm here, for the, I'm here for the justice that God wants. But when we're doing it on our agenda for our little kingdom, all we're doing is tearing down relationships and hurting ourselves and being trapped in that debt to debt of relationship. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And we forgive because God forgave us first. Let's pray together.